Hello and welcome back to Let's Play Jane's Fighters Anthology as we do our uh, final quick mission for the uh, Russian campaign in which we will be the uh, B2 spirit and we will uh, give a little history about that. So let's just set up a quick mission here. Uh, 22 Raptors. Custom weapons load. We will be Lady Vostok. Uh... 20,000 feet. Uh, let's put it at 50 miles. Give time for the um, the F-22s to run ahead, and they will face off against three Su-35s. And our ground target is going to be a large airfield, which we should be able to effectively level. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Actually, I'm curious if we can optimize this. Well, that's 30. Which is two less than that. I think these end up being, yeah, 28. That's interesting that. Which is this? That's also 30. So we get the most bombs if we can just get the straight up Mark 82s. Um, what we can do here. Oh, now that's interesting. Normally we would get four 2,000 pounders. These would probably act less punch. But it looks like it lets us put anything in here that we want, so... Eh. We'll stick with the, uh, the four packs, and uh, we're not going to bother with fuel, so... Let's jump into the mission. Alright, and uh, we'll let the F-22s take the lead. Looks like our target should be straight ahead. So, will we have time? Uh, the origins of the B-2. So by the mid-1970s, military aircraft designers um, basically discovered the concept of stealth and of reducing uh, radar signatures, so the United States, uh, in 1974, uh, DARPA actually requested information from U.S. aviation firms about the largest radar cross-section of an aircraft that could effectively remain invisible to radars. Um, Northrop and McDonnell Douglas were both selected for initial development, but Lockheed also had experience in this field due to developing the Lockheed A-12 and the SR-71, which, even though they were 50s vintage, did incorporate a number of stealthy features, uh, such as the use of composites, canted vertical stabilizers, and eventually an overall finish in radar-absorbing paint. Uh, computer models ended up being key to enabling this development, as they were able to um, predict uh, how radar reflection or how radar would reflect from the various surfaces of an aircraft towards or away from the emitter. So in 1975, DARPA started the Experimental Survivability Test Project and Northrop Grumman and um, Lockheed Martin were awarded contracts for the first round of testing. Uh, Lockheed ended up getting the um, award for the second test round in April 1976 leading to Hat Blue and the F-117 program. Uh, Northrop, though, also had a demonstration aircraft, Tacit Blue, in development in 1979 at Area 51, which developed stealth technology, low observable uh, materials, fly-by-wire curved surfaces, composite materials, electronic intelligence, and battlefield surveillance aircraft experimental. And that program later evolved into uh, the B-2, amongst other programs. So by 1976, these programs um, had gotten to the point where it's like, hey, we can apply these to a long-range strategic bomber. So President Carter and um, uh, became aware of these developments in 1977 and was one of the reasons that the B-1 bomber program was canceled. Uh, further studies were ordered in early 78 by which Hav Blue was uh, producing usable data. And then um, Reagan uh, said that um, Carter was weak on the fence and used the B-1, though as uh, 
in a silly attempt to stay elected or to get re-elected, the Carter administration developed that the DoD was working to develop stealth aircraft, and that's why they ended up uh, canceling the B-1. So, the Advanced Technology Bomber Program began in 1979, and uh, full development of the Black Project followed, which was funded under the code name Aurora, which of course uh, gave credence to all those conspiracy theories. I'm sorry, did the F-22s lose? No, they still got one there. Is it just the one? No, there's the second one. I think. There we go, now I'm only seeing... Uh... Nope, that's another one. Okay. okay. I was getting worried there for a second. Uh, but... Um... We've got nothing yet, as far as ground targets go. So, in the end, the ATB program got narrowed down to a North Rock Boeing team and a Lockheed Rockwell team. And uh, both, both teams used the flying wing design that uh, became the basis of the B-2. The North Rock proposal was senior ice and Lockheed was senior pay. And uh, Northrop had prior experience developing the YB-35 and YB-49 flying wing aircraft. And um, so their design was a bit larger, but was tailless, whereas the Lockheed design had a small tail. And originally the Air Force planned to procure 165 of these ATB bombers. And Northrop's team was eventually selected as the winner in the 20th of October 1981 and they received the B2 designation and the spirit name. The bomber's design was changed in the mid-1980s when the mission profile was changed from high altitude to low altitude terrain falling which uh, delayed the first test flight by about two years and added a uh, billion dollars to the program's development costs. And by 1989, $23 billion had been spent on R&D for the B-2. And uh, under a five-year classified contract, MIT engineers and scientists actually helped effect, assess the mission effectiveness of the, the aircraft. So, basically, the, uh, the B-2 was already a great project before... Uh, before its official reveal to the public because of Carter's uh, attempt to, s to uh, get re-elected. But there was a lot of security around the B-2 project because, um, you know, they obviously wanted to keep these technologies and capabilities out of the hands of, you know, the Soviets and such. So, for manufacturing, they uh, bought a former Ford automobile assembly plant in Pico Rivera, California, and heavily modified it. And everyone involved was sworn to complete secrecy involving their work. And components were typically purchased through front companies and military officials would visit out of uniform, and staff members were routinely subjected to polygraph examinations. And even uh, Congress was uh, limited in its ability to procure information about the project until the uh, mid-1980s. And uh, Northrop was the primary contractor. Other uh, subcontractors include Boeing, Hughes Aircraft, which became Raytheon, GE, and Vought Aircraft. And uh, I'm still not seeing... We do have an air ground radar. Okay, so there's our target. Yep, the F 22s uh, took out some of the aircraft on the ground, so that basically verifies that that's our target. But the. Um, and actually, um, in 1984, Northrop employee Thomas Cavanaugh 
was arrested for attempting to sell classified information about the program to the Soviet Union. And uh, he was sentenced to life in prison but released on parole in 2001. The, um... Alright, let's just line up here. The B-2 was first publicly displayed on the 22nd of October 1988 at the United States Air Force Plant 42 in Palmdale, California, where it was assembled. The viewing was heavily restricted, however, and guests were not allowed to see the rear of the B-2. However, uh, <laughs> the military kind of goofed and uh, there was no airspace restrictions above the presentation area, so Aviation Week uh, flew a helicopter or something out there and managed to take aerial photographs of the aircraft's then secret rear section with the suppressed engine exhaust. So uh, it kind of let the cat out of the bag there. But um, the first public flight of the B-2 was on uh, July 17, 1989, from Palmdale to Edwards Air Force Base. And uh, another engineer in October 2005, Noshir Gawadia, an engineer who worked on the B-2's propulsion system, was arrested for selling B-2-related information to foreign countries, and they were convicted and sentenced to 32 years in prison for their role, or for their actions. Now, as I mentioned previously, originally there was a uh, 132 aircraft plan, but this was later reduced to 75. And then by the early 1990s, um, you know, with the Cold War being over and stuff, the Soviet Union dissolved, um, President George Herbert Walker Bush uh, announced that production would be limited to 20 aircraft. But, um,. But in 1996, Clinton authorized the conversion of a prototype to a uh, operational model. Uh, so, and then there were 21 aircraft. And because of the extensive R&D involved, the flyaway cost was uh, $566 million per bomber in 1996 dollars. And time to start the bombing. We can see some of the work that the uh, F-22s are doing there. Actually, we can see uh, F see them in our bomb scope too. That's kind of cool. Alright, that should be good for a first bomb run. There goes the Chinese bunker. There goes some of their houses. Ah, uh, we missed that bunker by a little bit, but that's fine. Uh, so because of this, the um, obviously there was a public outcry for this. Um, as they cost three times as much to operate as the B-1 and uh, four times as much as the B-52 and uh, as of September of 1997 each hour B-2 flight necessitated 119 hours of maintenance versus uh, 53 for the B-52 and 60 for the B-1 and this is uh, part of this reason what factored all factored into this is the B-2 in order to maintain its stealth coatings, needed uh, air-conditioned, climate-controlled hangars, which obviously are pretty expensive. Not just in the actual construction costs, but also the electricity to operate. You know, especially since you know these guys are based in the desert, typically. So, maintenance costs were uh, about 3.4 million dollars a month per aircraft, and the military construction costs related to the project is about a half a billion dollars in 1997 dollars. Well, as a result of these costs, there, were, there was obviously broad opposition to the project, including uh, such notable people as John Cage and uh, Don McCain. But the, um, the B-2 project was very innovative. Well, which allowed us to at least get the uh, the 20-some examples that we had. 
in the sense that a number of upgrade packages have been applied to the V2, including um, a redesigned onboard computing architecture, um, a fiber optic network for data transfer, a new version of the uh, flight program software, with a conversion of legacy code from the Jovial programming language to C, and updates to weapon control systems to enable strikes upon moving targets such as ground vehicles, since that's mostly what it's been used for, is just, you know, like bombing ISIS and whatnot. And uh, on the 29th of December 2008, um, the Air Force awarded them a contract to modernize the radars. Uh, and this was actually pushed by requirement as the United States Department of Commerce had sold the uh, radio spectrum that the B-2's radars operated in to another operator. So, um, and it, the B-2's continued to be used for R&D with the Air Force Research Laboratory uh, developing new material to be used on the uh, on the trailing edge wing that was subject to engine exhaust in 2010, uh, which was designed to replace material that was uh, basically that degraded really quickly. So this was supposed to maintain stealth while having uh, more durability. Let's see if we can nab this bunker here. And there's been speculation that uh, B-2s might not be able to, not, might not have the stealth to reliably penetrate modern air defenses, which is part of the reason why um, critics had said, hey, that's why we have the F-35, and also why the B-21 project has been started, or the uh, next generation bomber. And uh, Northrop Grumman ended up getting that one too, and it's basically going to be a modernized B-2 with a flying wing design. Also, a unique fact about the B-2 is that uh, the uh, B-2 was recently fitted in 2013 with a common very low frequency receiver upgrade, which lets the B-2s uh, send radio transmissions on the same VLF frequencies as the Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines. Um, and this is part of their mission as, um, as uh, strategic nuclear bombers. And while originally they were planned to be operated until 2058, the retirement now is no later than 2032. Um, and I think that will be helped once the uh, B-21 Raider starts being produced and operated in the mid-2020s. So the range of the B-2 is approximately 6,000 nautical miles and at a cruising altitude B-2 typically refuels every six hours, taking on 45,000 kilograms of fuel at a time. And uh, this was one of the first projects that pioneered uh, the use of computer-aided design and manufacturing technologies because of the high level of precision needed for um, to design and manufacture the stealth into the bomber. Singles on the uh, control tower. Oh well. We've pretty much knocked this airfield out. So, the B 2 does have a smaller crew than uh, most bombers, but the crew of four as opposed to the crew of five. And it's automated, so one crew member and either sleep in a bed, use a toilet, or prepare a meal while the others monitor the aircraft. And uh, they've actually, the Air Force has actually conducted extensive sleep cycle and fatigue research to improve crew performance on long sorties, because most of the time B-2s operate from the continental U.S. So they, um, you know, they'll fly out to wherever they need to drop their bombs, like in Iraq or, or Afghanistan, and then fly back. Uh, lately, I think the Air Force has been forward-facing some B-2s, but uh, at least early in their program, they operated 
almost exclusively from the mainland U.S. So, you know, they would be flying for up to a day, a day and a half at a time on these round-trip bombing runs. And in its um, original intended scenario, the B-2 was going to perform deep penetrating nuclear strike missions uh, using stealth to penetrate enemy air defenses. So the B-2 has um, two internal bomb bays where uh, munitions can be stored on either a rotary launcher or two bomb racks. And uh, they can carry 40,000 pounds of ordnance, including nuclear ordnance. It's a has the B-61B and E-3 nuclear bomb and the AG-29 advanced cruise missile. Um, however, in light of the dissolution of the Soviet uh, Union, it's been re-equipped for conventional strike missions, including precision strikes, so it can equip uh, Mark 82 and Mark 84 bombs. Uh, JDAMs, it was equipped with a GPS-aided targeting system and an APQ-181 synthetic aperture radar. It can deploy the CBU-87, which I believe is a cluster bomb, um, gator mines, and the CBU-97 sensor-fused weapon. And uh, it's also capable of deploying the massive ordnance penetrator, which is a giant conventional bunker buster. Oh, I guess we're not getting that one. <laughs> and uh, that is uh, basically the mother of all bombs. Oh, hey, we got the fuel tank in that, uh, that one, too, so that's good. Um, so they can equip uh, two massive ordnance penetrators, which are 30,000 pounds. And uh, one, it, each one takes up pretty much the entire weapon span of the B-2, so you can carry two. However, um, the AGM-158 JASM cruise missile is another weapon that's been added to the B-2's arsenal, and um, this is also going to be followed by a new version of the long-range standoff weapon, which will give the B-2 standoff nuclear strike capability, and uh, it's possible that they may even be retrofitted to carry uh, long-range anti-ship missiles that I know the Air Force is already retrofit uh, working on retrofitting B-1s and B-52s to carry, so that would also be an interesting development. And uh, worth noting is that the AN APQ 181 radar on the B 2 is a low probability of intercept system, although I don't believe it was a. Uh, let me check real quick here. It was a PASIS system, so passive electronic and scan array, not a true ASA system. Um, fully digital navigation with terrain following radar and GPS capability. NAS-26 Astro Inertial Navigation System, which um, the first version of that system was tested on the Northrop SM-62 Snark cruise missile, which actually sounds familiar. Ah, uh, yes, of course, that was uh, that was an early attempt at making an international nuclear cruise missile or intercontinental nuclear cruise missile. Um, I believe there are some incidents with that system, though, uh, where they, their uh, INS was notoriously unreliable, and uh, and they ended up being like hundreds of miles off course to the point where they were like uh, the U.S. would test them by firing them into the uh, Gulf of Mexico, and they would just like end up in you know Brazil or some shit. <laughs> But this one is more advanced, and the, um, they also have a defensive management system to inform the crew of possible threats. Uh, basically, you know, uh, electronic warfare speeding compassing jammers, RFUR, and whatnot. And, uh, let's do one final run. After this. I don't know how much health is left on the actual airfield itself. But, uh, the B-2 
two has also received other upgrades such as uh, Link, Link 16 Data Links, High Frequency Satellite Link, um, and um, the, that radar, the AN APQ 181, was also retrofitted to become an active electronically scanned array that radar. Uh, one unique fact about the B-2 is because of its composite structure, it is required to stay 40 miles away from thunderstorms to avoid static discharge and lightning strikes. Oh, the paint, in addition to being um, radar absorbing, is also anti-reflective in order to reduce the aircraft's visibility during the daytime. It also has an upward facing light sensor which alerts the pilot to increase or reduce altitude to match the change in the luminance of the sky. And the original design had tanks for a contrail inhibiting chemical, but this was replaced in production aircraft by a contrail sensor that alerts the crew when they should change altitude. B2 is vulnerable to visual interception at ranges of 20 nautical miles or less. Reportedly, the B-2 has a radar cross-section of about 0.1 meters square. And obviously it suffers the, uh, the same problems as the F-117 or other stealth aircraft as it's not stealthy when you open the weapons bay. Kind of like what we're doing now, since we didn't put air defenses on this airfield, so we can just, you know, once the fighters were gone, we could just run around and uh, with our bomb bay doors open. And uh, as far as the operational history of the B-2, the first aircraft was christened the Spirit of Missouri and was delivered to Whiteman Air Force Base, Missouri, where the fleet is based on the 17th of December 1993. ILC was reached on January 1st, 1997. And uh, their combat debut was in 1999 during the Kosovo War where it was responsible for destroying 33% of selected Serbian bombing targets in the first eight weeks of the U.S. involvement in the war. During this war, six B-2s flew non-stop to Kosovo from their home base in Missouri and back totaling 30 hours. Although the bombers counted for 50 sorties out of the total 34,000 NATO sorties, they dropped 11% of all bombs. And the B-2 was the, also the first aircraft to deploy uh, GPS satellite guided JDAM bombs. Combat use of Kosovo. And the use of JDAMs and precision guided munitions effectively replaced the controversial tactic of carpet bombing, uh, which had been harshly criticized due to it causing indiscriminate civilian casualties and fire problems. However, uh, on the 7th of May 1999, a B2 dropped five JDAMs on the Chinese embassy, killing several staff, um, in which um, I believe the official explanation is. The Air Force, they programmed the wrong address essentially into the bombs they were supposed to be bombing like across the street from the embassy. But obviously that caused a uh, fair bit of outrage, as you might imagine. Uh, the B-2 also saw service in Afghanistan, striking ground targets for Operation Enduring Freedom. That was actually not too far off the mark. Close enough, we got the bunker. Um, it also obviously was in um, Operation Iraqi Freedom, where they operated from Diego Garcia and an undisclosed forward operating location, which I believe... I want to say there were reports recently, as of when this video was made, that they can be deployed to the UAE. So that might have been it. Um, other uh, forward operating locations that they've been known to operate from are Anderson Air Force Base in Guam and RAF Fairford in the UK. And they dropped uh, 1.5 million pounds of munitions, including 583 J Dams in 2003. And uh, the B-2s were the first U.S. aircraft that uh, 
spring into action during Operation Anzidon, which was the UN sanctioned uh, intervention in Libya, where they dropped 40 bombs, uh, oh, three B-2s dropped 40 bombs on a Libyan airfield in support of the UN no-fly zone. Because obviously that's the way to enforce a no-fly zone rather than, you know, just shooting down aircraft that violate it. I think we took a bit of latitude with that one. And they flew directly from the U.S. mainland across the Atlantic to Libya and back. They were refueled four times during the trip. And final bomb release. There we go, that bucket is going for now that we basically eliminated that airfield, we can fly east. Uh, on the 28th of March, 2013, um, two B-2s flew a round trip of 13,000 miles from Whitman Air Force Base in Missouri to South Korea, dropping dumbing ordnance on the Jikdo target range, and as part of as part of the annual South Korean United States military exercises. Uh, this was the first time that B-2s actually overflew the Korean Peninsula. And, um, in August of 2011, um, or rather in May in 2011, uh, B-2s were actually considered to, um, as an option against, uh, Bin Laden, where they would just carpet bomb the, uh, well not carpet bomb, but drop a bunch of JDAMs on Bin Laden's, uh, lair, rather than sending in the Special Forces. However, uh, they were worried they might miss him and that he would escape again and that they wouldn't be able to identify his body even if they did hit him until ultimately special forces were sent in. On the 18th of January 2017, UB2s attacked an ISIS training camp 19 miles southwest of Syria, Libya, killing around 85 militants. And altogether, they dropped about 108 500 pound JDAM bombs. And uh, during that sort of HP2 flew a 34 hour round trip mission from Whitman Air Force Base with 15 refuelings during the trip. And uh, one B2 has been lost, fortunately not in action, but during an accident uh, during the 23rd of February 2008 when the Spirit of Kansas crashed on the runway shortly after takeoff from Anderson Air Force Base in Guam. The two-person crew had ejected safely from the aircraft and survived, but the aircraft was a haul loss valued at $1.4 billion. So uh, the Air Force uh, took the whole fleet off of operational status until they could figure out what went, went wrong. And the problem was later determined to be moisture in the aircraft support transducer units during air data calibration, which destroyed the information being sent to the bomber's air data system. So, flight control computers calculated an inaccurate airspeed and a negative angle of attack, causing the aircraft to pitch upward 30 degrees during takeoff. In February 2010, there was another accident at uh, Anderson Air Force Base in the Spirit of Washington, where an aircraft was severely damaged by fire on the ground, and they had to go to uh, go undergo 18 months of repairs in order to fly it back to the United States for even more repairs. And the uh, Spirit of Washington did not return to service until December 2013. Uh, at the time, the Air Force had no training to deal with tail pipe fires in the B-2s, something which undoubtedly contributed to uh, the extensive damage suffered by that aircraft. And the B-2s have uh, periodically made appearances at air shows, although it's a very rare occurrence. Um, specifically, I know uh, the past, uh, I believe the past, I think two years ago for sure, and possibly last year as well, uh, flybys of the B-2 were done at uh, EAA in Oshkosh. As far as engines go on the B-2, it makes use of four General Electric F-118 G100 non-afterburning turbofans for a max speed of 550 knots at 40,000 feet altitude, which is about Mach 0.95 at sea level. It cruises at about 487 knots slow with a thrust to weight ratio of 205, so it's not going to be doing anything too vertical. 
and uh, that's about it for what I have for the B2, so for once we'll actually be done before we make it back to the airfield, so. Then we got the you're almost home thing, so I think we just gotta... We're just gonna come in nice and hot here. that brake back on. There we go. Bump up our engine a little bit to cushion our landing. Rudder over and perfectly. Welcome back. And there's no sense really waiting to park since we have no wingman, so we're just going to end the mission here. So it was a roaring success. I have no idea what the casualties were on the F-22s. I think they might have suffered one loss against the Su-35s, but we suffered no damage thanks to them. We ended up destroying 24 structures and one fighter on the ground. Our bombs only had a hit rate of 55%, but we dropped, what, 64... 64 plus 56, so something like 120 bombs, give or take. I'm not going to do the exact math. Now. So it can carry a absolute shit ton of bombs. So I think that should about conclude us for um, for the um, quick missions. And it looks like we have plenty of Lenny Vostok uh, single missions. It looks like about 10, so... Look forward to that over the next five weeks, and with that, thank you all for watching, and stay tuned for next time, and we'll see you then.